you know, before we get into some of those things, let's try to clarify uh, from Amir Hussain what what the technology is really capable of. So, so, so Amir, if you can briefly talk about the fact whether this is really the kind of breakthrough that people are talking about, or is it something that has been around for a while and has only gotten in the hands of people and there is a certain novelty yeah. to it and that novelty will wear off? Or is it really a step towards artificial, an important step towards artificial general intelligence, which is what yeah. a lot of people are afraid of and are kind of warning against? So what yeah. is the limitations of the technology that goes forward? I mean, there's a lot to say uh, already in context of what has been said here. The first thing I'll tell you is that, you know, this kind of obsession with artificial general intelligence and being scared of artificial general intelligence. Over the last two decades, I've been fighting this fight. I've been speaking at South by Southwest and I've had people protest outside my talks, stop the robots and so on and so forth. And what I see is that over time, uh, you know, game theoretic things are in play in the world. So, for example, when I started uh, talking about the application of artificial intelligence in the battle space, eight, seven, eight, ten years ago, we came up with this concept of hyperwar, and we published it from an academic perspective. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of people saying, "Well, this is never going to happen. Ban it, ban it, ban it." My view, my point of view was, you don't control everybody that you want to ban. So if one party elects to pursue software-based technology, which is invisible, it's not like a nuclear reactor that you can fly a U-2 over and verify that it exists in a country. It's basically unverifiable innovation. If you assume that there are multiple participants in the world and one is uh, uh, developing a technology of a type that gives them a tremendous advantage, what would you do not knowing perfectly whether or not that person is complying with whatever law framework ban they need to be complying with? Game theory dictates that you will do the same you will develop that capability because you will always worry that there's a 2%, 5% chance that the other person is doing it. So my point here is, the, the larger point is that in technology developments of this magnitude, there is a game theoretic push towards developing the technology fast. All of the discussions that, that emanate at the beginning of such a technology coming about which are essentially, well, what's the plus and what's the minus? The point is, if the plus is larger than a certain quantum, and if the plus is larger than a, than a quantum that would give you a relative advantage over another competitor, you are going to pursue it no matter what. So the first thing I would tell you is that based on my experience now with such technological innovations in the past, at least two or three times, Chat GPT is only going to get better, bigger, faster, and it's not going to be Chat GPT. The Chinese are working on Wu Dao 2.0 or Chat GPT 4, which is a whole collection of models that's going to come out. There was uh, two days ago the uh, uh, Facebook or Meta, they had their Llama model, which has now been uh, actually through 4chan, it's been leaked. So you can actually go download the, the Facebook Llama model and start building applications with that. The point is, it's out of the box, okay? There's no way in which this stays inside the box. So the, the discussion really now becomes, okay, what do we do with this that's constructive? And what are the potential downsides knowing that we can't stop it? That should be the framework, not whether we can stop it regardless of the downside. So now there, what I'll tell you is that, uh, Banori Saab made a point earlier about the ability for these models to predict text. And therefore he correlated that with the implication of these models on activities that are essentially um, textually productive in nature, you know, writing a report, things like that, chat, et cetera. In reality, what's happening inside the AI is not at all, it doesn't care about the text. These are tokens. They can be tokens depicting anything in a sequence. And the amazing thing here is that the amount of human intelligence and activity that is just token and sequence prediction has been kind of exposed. The reason why chat GPT and actually multimodal models, so chat GPT is basically text in, text out, right? That's what it does right now. All of the tokens, these individual words that are being predicted by chat GPT, they're just tokens. One token is one word. There you go. Now, what if tokens are also pixels? What if tokens are fragments of a picture? 
What if tokens are fragments of an audio signature or uh, fragments of sound, fragments of the output of a vibration sensor? All of these things are legitimate tokens. So it is not the case that this technology is limited to text. In fact, GPT-4 and WUDAO 2.0 and many of the models that are already working in labs are multimodal in nature. What does that mean? That means that in a few months, we will be going into entering a world where you will be able to ask for text concerning a picture, have the picture explained back in text and have a, create a picture of a poetess, have the poetess write a poem again using these models and, and then develop a, a beautiful singing voice for that poetess to sing the voice. And now with NERF, which is three-dimensional mapping of these images, create a virtual reality in which that world now exists for you. So no, it's not just about text, it's about everything. Another area of work that's happening, which is around taking tokens as action sequences. So for example, let's say you want, I'm, I'm going to use a cricket example because PSL is going on these days. So what is a well-executed shot? Well, a well-executed shot is something that starts with a particular observation. How is the bowler going to deliver the delivery? Where the delivery is going to land? How do you position yourself? What footwork do you do? How do you execute through your wrists and arms and forearms, et cetera, a shot? All of these things can be broken down into tokens. Each individual atomic movement is a token. So. GPT-3 does not care. You can give it tokens that are automatically captured through visual AI, watching a player play, map those individual atomic movements to a token, and then have GPT execute as a consequence of it knowing what the best tokens are to replay a perfect cricketing shot. In fact, there, are, there is work going on now in using these transformers and these large, what I would call token models, not just language models, to actually animate robots. So now those are the types of things that we are already at. I think the discussion, if it were to just talk about what, what is GPT and its text output and is it what it says, is it true or false? And what does that do for an essay? I think we're already talking about something that's probably now a six month old concern. The real concern is this is already out there. Nobody can stop it. It's already leaked. What are we gonna do about it? How do our students, faculties, how do our educational organizations benefit from this? That's the conversation. It's not gonna be put back in the box.